We want to remind our listeners that this program is for informational and educational purposes only and not intended to substitute for professional veterinary medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. The Animal Medical Center does not recommend or endorse any products or services advertised by SiriusXM. Welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. This is the place to talk about your pets and get advice with a top veterinarian from the Animal Medical Center in NYC. Hear from the leading authorities on animals and ask your questions. Now, here's your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Vet, a podcast for people who just love their pets. I'm so glad you could join me today. I'm your host, Dr. Ann Hohenhaus. I'm a senior veterinarian and director of pet health information at the Schwarzman Animal Medical Center here in lovely New York City. We've got an interesting program today. My friend and special guest, Dr. Nigel Swift, who's the global head of sustainable agriculture and one health at Dallin Animal Health a biotech company. Dr. Swift helped in the development of the first vaccine for honeybees. I can't wait to hear about those little teeny tiny syringes that they use to give those vaccines. And this vaccine has recently received a conditional approval from the United States Department of Agriculture. Those are the folks that approve vaccines for animals. This is the first vaccine approved for any insect in the United States. So this is a groundbreaking product, and we're going to have the expert in that vaccine to talk about it this afternoon. There's so much more information to share on today's show, so please stay tuned. The Schwarzman Animal Medical Center is the only level one trauma center in New York City and is the largest veterinary teaching hospital in the world. Do you have a question about your pet's health that you would like me to answer? Just email me at askthevet at amcny.org. And I'll give that again later in the show if you can't remember it or you don't have a pen and pencil to write it down. You send me an email with a question at askthevet at amcny.org, and I'll answer your question on next month's Ask the Vet show. So stay tuned because I've got some great questions to answer today. And now it's time for our trending animal of the month. It's time for the internet's most talked about animal. At the Samburu National Reserve in Northern Kenya, an elephant named Alto gave birth to a set of girl twins, which according to the Save the Elephants Conservation Group is a rare event for our planet's largest mammals. African elephants have the longest gestation period of any living mammal. But these poor girls are pregnant for nearly 22 months, and I thought nine was a killer. They give birth about every four years. They usually give birth to only one elephant baby, and in the wild, elephant twins rarely survive. But the conservation group is optimistic about the prospects for Alto's babies because there's lots of food in their park following a lot of rain during the rainy season. And the mother has amazing support of her other elephant herd members. According to the Kenya Wildlife Service, there are more than 36,000 elephants in the East African country. If you want more information about Alto's twins and for some amazing photos of these cutie pies, just Google elephant twins in Kenya. And that elephant story in Africa is a great lead in to our guest today. Uh, my guest is my good friend, Dr. Nigel Swift. He grew up a little bit south of Kenya in South Africa, attended veterinary school at the Royal College in London, and then came to the States to do a residency in internal medicine at UC Davis. Then he jumped across the pond west to Sydney, Australia, where he established an ER specialty hospital that grew over the next decade. Then he moved back to the United States to follow his wife, who's also a veterinarian and another friend of mine, and began nearly a 14-year career at Boringal Engelheim, an animal health company, that one of their products is vaccines that many pets in the United States receive. It's at Boringer that he got involved in pet vaccines. When he retired from Boringer, it only lasted for six weeks because the CEO of Dallin Animal Health called to talk about their bee vaccine. And well, now here he is on Acevet to talk about the bee vaccine. So Nigel, your career has been absolutely fascinating. Having lived and worked in several countries, we're gonna come back to that. But I always like to start my questions by finding out, um, did you grow up with pets? 
did you know you want to be a veterinarian from a young age? Hello, Anne, and thank you so much for having me on the show. Yes, it is um, It is great to reconnect. And I guess, yeah, like many of us vets, I, I was fortunate to grow up around animals. We always had cats and dogs growing up, and family holidays in South Africa were often safaris, so we'd go out and watch animals. Growing up, we had a family friend who was a vet, and she was really my first role model. Um, I would spend time in her clinic as a kid, and since eight years of age, all I've ever wanted to be is a vet. And incidentally, she's now 85 years old. She's still practicing in Johannesburg and providing radiation oncology treatment to pets in South Africa. So she's been quite the role model. That's actually great information to know because the United States has a lot of access to radiation therapy for pets with cancer, but a lot of the other countries are very sparse, even in Europe where veterinary medicine is on par with or better in some places than in the U.S. So that's a, a good tidbit when someone reaches right. out to me. So talk about Sydney. Sydney is one of my most favorite cities. Many years ago when I was there, I became obsessed with the opera house. And every morning I'd walk out to Mrs. Macquarie's point in the Botanic Garden, just so that I could look at the opera house from, from that viewpoint. But you started, was it the first? Somehow I think it was the first ER specialty hospital in Sydney. Yes, the Animal Referral Hospital was the first multi-specialty emergency clinic. So I was fortunate as a, a young internist out of UC Davis to connect with a couple of surgeons and ophthalmologists who were in the university itching to do what had been done in the US already. And so we really took that model and and established a, um, a hospital in Sydney that continues to be successful. Well, and I, I suspect there are more these days, is that right? That Sydney, oh, like sure, the US right. has just exploded with uh, yeah. specialty hospitals? There are several in Sydney and one in really every every major city of Australia. The, the usual model of um, an emergency clinic and, um, and a specialty hospital. So Nigel had a very interesting lead in. Was it before you went to Boringer that you did that multinational MBA? Or was that part it, of it? It was really, really early on, and I you know, transitioning as from a vet to um into industry, I wanted to do an MBA just to to sort of sharpen my financial skills. And it was also personal interest as well, because it was a, a joint program with NYU in New York and London School of Economics. So there was a big political science part of it as well, which has always been an interest of mine. But yeah. So this MBA, like every time you open up Facebook, Nigel was in a different country doing something. It was <laughs> it was like a great vicarious deal for me, because I think when you were doing that, I was more at home because I had a young child at home. And, you, you know, you kind of have to stay around when they're little and, and be sure they're OK. And so I was having the time of my life because you were like everywhere and there'd be great pictures and interesting things that went on. So that started the Boringer career where. Did you intend to work on vaccines when you went? Is that where you started with Boringer? It, it is where I, well, it is where I started with vaccines. And it's funny, you know, I, I was starting in a marketing role. And so the MBA really made sense from that perspective. But what I was marketing was pet vaccines. We were um, working on control programs for rabies and parvo and Khaleesi virus and animal shelters. And then I got into the commercialization of vaccines as well as running programs. So Yes, Bo Boehringer really got me the start there. It wasn't an intention, but I've just been fascinated. And I've, I've really stuck with vaccines through my Boehringer career of 14, 15 years. So the vaccines that Boehringer makes are marketed in the U.S. Um, and so many people listening to this show, their pets are benefactors of those vaccines, right? For sure. I mean, we um, Boehringer has a a wide variety of vaccines for cats and dogs, for all nature of um, of farm species. And so as I worked around the world, initially I started on pet vaccines, but um, went to China and worked on development of vaccines for swine and poultry, for classical swine fever, for avian influenza, and um, came back to France. We worked on vaccines for foot and mouth disease for the US Strategic Reserve. Um, so it's been a it's always been vaccines, but many different species. So for the, our listeners, foot and mouth disease is uh, a cattle disease. We don't have it in the United States, right? 
Correct. We don't have foot and mouth disease in the US. It's really a foot and mouth is a disease of developing countries where control programs are, are more challenging, but it's a major threat to US agriculture. And so what we developed was a, um, a foot and mouth antigen bank for the US government. So the disease is not in the US, but the government provides funding for an anti for a vaccine bank. So that if the vex if the disease comes to the US, there are doses readily available to protect US um, livestock. Well, and and because we don't have that disease in the US, our cattle have no immunity against that. So a a, a cow coming to the US foot and mouth disease and infecting our cattle would be like COVID for cows all over because we all got sick from COVID because nobody had any immunity. And the same thing would happen to the cattle um, if foot and mouth disease got here. So even though Nigel and I are both small animal veterinarians by training, I, I haven't touched a cow in years. Um, I still know how important foot and mouth disease is to the country um, because if it affected our cattle, we would have no meat, no milk, and it would be a huge economic issue for the country. So it, it's a grave concern, even though most people never heard about foot and mouth disease. Right. And it's impacting cattle and swine. So it would really wipe out the um, U.S. agriculture. So I think the there's a lot of investment. The U.S. Department of Ag um, do a lot of work in surveillance. The Border, Border Patrol do a lot of work in surveillance. And really, it's a, there's an impressive organization behind the scenes in this country to to protect the borders. From infectious diseases. Because yeah. I, it, it's, it's enormous because, you know, I hold a USDA accreditation to write health certificates for animals traveling internationally. And there's always some refresher course I have to take and it somehow always manages to include foot and mouth disease. Right, because it's so important. So you left Boringer and you had you had a plan to retire. It was short lived. Um, <laughs> I think I I think I lasted about six weeks. Um, you know, I'm I'm passionate about this one health topic and the the knowledge that the health of animals and people and the planet are interlinked. And we we know the world is facing threats of climate change, biodiversity loss, collapse of pollinators. And Dallin is the first company to tackle honeybee health through vaccination. So it's really, it's such an exciting area of science that can have an impact. And the, the notion of what they were doing, but then really talking to our CEO, Annette Kleiser, meeting the rest of the Dallin team who are so passionate about the, the work, that really sealed it for me to say, you know, there's, there's a lot more that, um, that I can be doing than putting my feet up at this point. <laughs> So how do you vaccinate a honeybee? Because I, I am, although I made a joke in the opening about little teeny tiny syringes, I am 100% certain that that is not reality. You know, bees are a fascinating um, set of creatures. And the, the way the vaccine works is to, is to apply it through the queen. Now, of course, a queen bee never actually goes and eats her own food. She's fed by attendants, by nurse bees. And so what we have to do is to collect a queen and eight or 10 nurse bees, put them together in a little cage with a vaccine mixed into a sugar paste. And the attendants will eat the sugar paste. They will make royal jelly with vaccine in it. And they will feed that to the queen. And the queen will then produce eggs that are vaccinated. So it's a really fascinating transgenerational vaccination process. So who had that idea? Because it's really cool. It is really cool. And in fact, this... Um, you know, the founders of the company, Annette um, is our current CEO, but the chief scientific officer is Daliel Freitag. And Daliel, by, by the way, the, the Dalian is the D-A-L of Daliel and the A-N of Annette. So D Daliel and Annette founded this company um, from research that was being done at University of Helsinki. They had some B research ongoing. Daliel was working there in the lab. Um, ultimately, Helsinki lost their funding, but Daliel and Annette agreed that this was an idea that could probably fly with um with private funding so they founded a company um dalla with private funding to take this concept of vaccinating bees and um and make it into a, a real product so what are 
what disease in bees should I be worried about? Uh, how do, at, well, maybe how do you even know that a bee is sick? Uh, okay. I have so many bee questions. Yeah, I know. And, you know, I mean, honeybees have really, over the last 10, 20 years in the, in the US, but also globally, come under enormous stress. You think about everything that we, we hear about with, um, with climate change, with loss of biodiversity, which means loss of food sources for bees. And then the way be, you know, bees are exposed to a huge number of pesticides, which weakens them. Um, and they're trucked around the country to pollinate almonds in California. And then they're put on the back of trucks and they go to Maine to pollinate blueberries. So there's a lot of stresses. And over time, we've seen these stressed creatures develop more signs of disease. So they get mites, but they get a variety of bacterial and viral diseases. And this first vaccine is a vaccine against a, um, a bacteria. And the sad thing is the first that you know that you have this bacteria in your hive is all of the larvae are dead. So it's a disease of uh, one or two day old larvae. A beekeeper will open the hive, notice a horrible smell, and will find that the, the larvae have been infected and, and literally wiped out. So it's a, it's a, it's a nasty disease. And, and one for which we're, we're happy that we have the first preventive solution now. What kind of bacteria is, is the cause of this disease? Do we have, it's, does it have a name? It's a tough one. It's called Penobacillus larvae. Um, not one that anyone's ever heard of because it's a bee specific bacteria. Um, the tough thing about this bacteria is it's a, it's a spore former. So it goes from its growth phase into essentially a hibernating phase where it forms a, a, a shell, it forms a spore and it can survive in the environment for 70 years. So virtually impossible to wipe out, but when it spreads into a hive, um, either from contamination of beekeeping equipment or other bees coming into the hive or bees going out and um, catching it from other bees, um, yeah, that's when it really blows up. But it's, a, it's an unusual bug. So I want to go back to the traveling bee situation because we don't have enough bees in a, in the United States that the main bees can just do their blueberry thing and not have to go to the oranges in California. You have to move bees around to do this. You know, I think what we see is with intensification of agriculture everywhere, we see the, the number of almond orchards in California now exceeds the number of bees that are there. And so almost half the country's bees are trucked into California in the springtime to pollinate the almonds. And once that's done, they're, they go back, they either go back home or they go to the next crop. And pollination services are a significant source of income for beekeepers who once were thought of as these guys that have a few hives that make just honey. Well, in fact, pollination services for some of them can be their major source of revenue. Interesting. So we have bees in New York City. Very commonly, people will have hives on top of their apartment buildings. Right. Um, and every year when my son was in high school, one of the families, that was one of the things that the school auction was honey from the um, the family's hives on top of their apartment building. And then you got a tour of their hives uh, so as cool. well, you know, and the school got the money from the auction item. And apparently... Now, this is what I've read. I have no knowledge of bees or whatever, but our bees in New York will fly to New Jersey to get pollen because we don't have enough pollen in New York to satisfy their need for pollen. So, but who knew the bees could fly across the Hudson River? I mean, it it's incredible. a big river. It's a big river, but these little, these tiny creatures will commonly travel two or three miles a day in search of food sources. Um, and even when we give them a food source, you know, just like all of us, they want a balanced diet. And so they'll want to find different sources of, um, of pollen, which have different um, amino acids in them or different sources of, um, of nectar. And so, yeah, they're, they're certainly, they, they cover considerable distances. And um, it's, it's part of the challenge of, of doing studies in these little creatures when you're trying to develop a vaccine is to to say that you have the, what are essentially wild animals that will go travel. <laughs> well, I think that's an important thing for our listeners to understand is if you've got a new vaccine for parvo, say people, people understand 
parvo, it's a bad and potentially fatal diarrhea disease of dogs. So you take some puppies and you give them your new vaccine and you give some of the puppies a fake vaccine and then you expose them to parvo and you see who gets sick. Now, that that's all well and good because you can be 100% sure that puppy A is puppy A because it has a name collar, it has a microchip and it, it's not going to go anywhere. You've got it in your can. So how do you prove that your vaccine works and that you just didn't swap out the bees for better bees? You know, it's been a really interesting challenge um, how to run studies on bees, particularly how to run studies on bees in a very controlled way that meets the very strict requirements of the regulatory authorities because you have essentially a wild animal. You can't put them into a lab. You put a beehive in a lab and the bees can't feed and so the, the hive will die. So the hive has to be in the field. And yet you can't challenge them with this disease because this bacteria is a notifiable disease um, that we don't want spreading into the environment. So what we've ended up doing is vaccinating the queens, putting the vaccinated queens into hives that are out, of the, out in the field she will then lay the eggs in the hive and then every few days we'll inspect the hive, take larvae out of the hive when they're one or two days old, take them back into the lab, do a very specific challenge in the lab to prove that those larvae from a vaccinated queen are in fact more resistant to disease than an unvaccinated larva. But it's been a, it's been a really interesting process to work out how to do that. And I have to say the the U.S. Department of Ag, um, the Center of Veterinary Biologics, which is our regulator, have been incredible to work with in terms of, you know, they, they're there. They're a tough challenge partner because they have their duty to, um, to Ag. But at the same time, I think they've really been supportive of helping build a process to license a honeybee vaccine because no process existed before. So just just for our listeners out there, the larvae are baby bees, in, in case somebody's not familiar with that right. term. And so you open up the hive, you scoop out a couple baby bees, and then you put them in a baby bee incubator and then see and expose them to this funky bacteria and see if they get sick or not. Right. We put them onto little Petri dishes in the lab, um, mixed into a sugar solution, and they eat the sugar solution for a week. And your challenge group has sugar solution mixed with bacteria. And the regular group is just sugar solution. And you see which ones survive. But these are these little baby bee larvae, they're tiny. They're two millimeters long at, at one, to do, one to two days old. So, What, what a really cool um, laboratory experiment, though. Um, the other thing, the other thing I want to be sure that the listeners know is regulatory body. Um Anybody that's worked getting vaccines approved always talks about the regulatory body, which is the United States government organization that says thumbs up or thumbs down to your vaccine coming to the market. So in this case, it's the USDA who, who manages all animal vaccines. So Correct. parvo for dogs, foot and mouth for cattle, and honeybee vaccines all go through the USDA, where if you have an antibiotic or a flea medicine, then those are going to go through a different regulatory body. So a little bit different than how human medicine works. Right. Where the med medicines are FDA, the, the yeah. um, antiparasitics are EPA. Yeah. yeah. And so a uh, little bit different terminology in the animal world. Same sort of process, though, is that these regulatory bodies have their clicks that they need to have you demonstrate so your product is safe but also efficacious so you didn't mention it but i'm guessing that this foul brood disease which are in my notes is the beekeeper's name for this bacterial disease that you're vaccinating against right american foul brood there are two foul broods there Basically, diseases that create smelly hives, and one is a European foul brood, one is an American foul brood. But there, yeah. That's so, the are are you going to, are you going to, is there going to be a European version of this vaccine? We will certainly look to license the vaccine um, wherever there is disease. So it won't necessarily be a European version. If the U.S., I mean, ideally, we would like to have one product that we can sell globally. And so that's the marketing person in him talking. <laughs> but at the end of the day, what we need to, you know, we need to do the studies. We need to work with the authorities in different countries to understand 
what the disease is there, make sure that the product we have works in that situation. And we recently obtained a license in Canada because they have a significant problem with American fowl brood in Canada. And so the authorities there, again, have been very supportive of us registering the product there. And um, we're currently in this in the process of contacting, not just build, building on contacting the US state vets to contact the Canadian vets to, to start to share with them the information because I think you and I both through, went through vet school and I think what we learned about bee medicine, going through vet school, you could write on one page of a very small piece of paper. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't think I learned anything about, well, maybe in Paris, would you have learned of parasitology? Like, because bees sometimes will sting animals. I don't actually know. Maybe in the ER, bee stings. That might be the only thing I learned. So yeah. are there other, oh, let's, let's talk one minute more minute about the approval process. How long does it take from the time you think you have a product that's going to work until the government says, go for it? Um, that all depends on whether you start running your studies in 2019. So Dallin ran studies 2019 to 2021, and which, which you may remember coincided with another global disease, which made logistics of running studies, getting outside and <laughs> doing things. Challenging. Oh, yeah. Um, running the studies to document the science as well as safety, efficacy, purity of the vaccine, developing the manufacturing process and going through that process with the authorities to get their buy in was about a four year process. Um, and as I said before, USDA were, were very supportive. They really understand the need for something to improve pollinator health. Um, and so I think this is really about not just licensing this vaccine, but essentially opening up a space to future insect vaccines. Are other insects besides bees pollinators? Are bees our only pollinators? Oh, we have many pollinators, um, bumblebees, all sorts of wild bees, moths, even hummingbirds. So, you know, there are there are many creatures out there that are, are pollinators. Um, but honeybees are the major, if you say, I would say managed population of bees that we, we raise fairly intensively in hive situations. And so um, that we want to address with these vaccines. Okay, so... The bees that you're talking about are not like my friends who are the hives on the roof, not like somebody who's got a hot couple of hives in their backyard. These these are agricultural bees. Oh, there are any any honeybees. So we when we the people that we are talking to about the vaccine might be a hobbyist who has one or two hives. It could be someone who is in Vermont and making honey with um 20 or 30 hives, or it could be a substantial, somebody who actually sets up to run pollination services in California who has 10,000 hives. Okay. So, the so then it can be completely different, but the, the, the bee is the same. The diseases are the same. So that means that if we have any listeners out there that have a hive on their apartment building roof or some hives in the backyard, you might want to think about vaccinating your bees. This is not just for work, you know, for commercial, commercial bees. This is for the hobby bee as well. That's right. Um, what's interesting, I mean, I, you know, we've all been on such a steep learning curve here, but, um, you know, a, a lot of beekeepers will replace their queen every one or two years. Um, so the queen doesn't live forever. And so the queen does need to be replaced from time to time. And what can make it easier for hobbyists is rather than buying a vial of vaccine and trying to do the vaccination themselves, they can actually buy a vaccinated queen. Yeah. Yeah. And so she just and gets delivered and put in the hive and then gets delivered United States yeah. Postal Service, a little queen with her attendance in a cage. Oh, yeah. that's great. I love that. You know, that there, there was some article, I don't actually know if it was true. It could have been fake news, but that somebody tried to get on a plane in Newark with his uh, emotional support bees. I was like, you got to be kidding. This this sounds like such a bad idea. I, and you know what the next thing will be is somebody will say, well, are your bees vaccinated? Um, and now they can't be. Right. So do you have um, 
is this Dallin's only product or are, are you making more B products or what, what else are you going to do now that this one's good to go? This, we have a USDA conditional license. The mm -hmm. conditional license says, okay, we fast tracked you because this is an important issue. And we still have some um, T's to cross and I's to dot, and we will continue to submit additional data to USDA over the coming year to gain full licensure. But there are several other diseases of bees that we're working on. So um, as well as American fowl brood, as I said, there's another bacteria called European fowl brood. There's chalk brood, and there's a number of viral diseases that are spread by mites. And so there's no shortage of work for us to tackle. And we have an R&D program that is looking at, I would say, bee diseases generally. Um, and then beyond that, insect diseases. Because, you know, beyond bees, insect farming is becoming a thing raising insects or animal feed. You know, there's, you'll certainly find insect bars in some health food shops. Um, and as we industrialize or commercialize any agricultural process, you will start to see disease in those animals. And so we'll need ways to address the health. So do you actually work with these bees yourself? Have you developed like bee handling skills? So, <laughs> so I say that and, and, and Nigel's laughing. I can see him on my zoom screen here. He's laughing because when you go to veterinary school, they spend a lot of time teaching you how to handle cattle and how to handle sheep and how to handle different species so that the animal is safe and you're safe. And so I have to say, how do you handle honeybees? How do you handle bees? The first thing is to make sure you have a good bee suit. Um, so last week I was in Vidalia, Georgia, uh, where we have a study going on with 400 hives. We opened up every single one of those hives. So myself and our, another of our scientists, I'd, I'd asked to do it just to be his intern for the week to, to get some experience. And I would say, you know, we, we always, you always go out with a smoker. You've probably seen pictures of a, of a beekeeper with a little smoker and the smoke tends to suppress the, the stress pheromones. And so it calms the bees down. We open the hive. Generally, the bees are pretty calm. Occasionally, they get angry. Um, but you're wearing a bee suit. It's protective leather gloves and um, a screen on your face that you can see through. If you're brave or foolish, then you wear a pair of jeans. And I would say four days in the field, six bee stings, and I would still go back. So <laughs> It sounds absolutely fascinating. And this has been such a great conversation. Nigel, great to catch up with you. Thank you so much for being here with us today on Ask the Vet. Thank you, Anne. It's been a pleasure. And we're going to take a break in a moment. But don't forget, if you have a question about your pet's health, just email me at Ask the vet at amcny.org, and I'll respond to your questions on next month's show. It's time for a short break, but please stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to have the animal news. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Welcome back to Ask the Vet. Now it's time for today's animal news. It's time for Animal Headlines, the biggest animal news from across the world. Our first story today is a 14-month-old burner named Nova. She was in training to be a service dog, and on the day she was set to take her first test, she slipped out of her harness and ran away and then went missing for two months. I'm thinking maybe she's not a good service dog candidate. So... Two months went by and two random hikers found her injured in the Colorado wilderness. The hikers attempted to carry her down the mountain, but plans changed when Nova bit one of the hikers. And I think these people did the right thing for the poor dog, and I'm sorry they got bit. But always remember that injured animals may be painful or frightened and may bite, even if they were lovely animals, because this dog probably hurt and they picked her up and tried to carry her out. And so if you need to handle an injured animal, always try and figure out if there's some way that you can muzzle the dog uh, while you pick it up to protect yourselves. So they decided since Nova was not having them carry her that they would, one of them stayed with her and the other one went for help. 
So happily, Nova returned to the family just in time for the holidays. And when she was reunited with her precious pup, the owner Robin Simmons Seeley told the Greeley Tribune that Nova miraculously survived two snowstorms, frigid temperatures, a severely broken front leg, and a 20 pound weight loss. On a personal note, thanks to the hikers who stopped to help Nova and to all of the others who responded helping in Nova's rescue. It does take a village to do a good thing. Our second story is a timely one because you can vote for the Wildlife Photographer of the Year. Nature fans every year are invited to vote for their favorite wildlife image and this year, these images include a family of monkeys posing for a Christmas card, a rescued chimpanzee, a polar bear sleeping on a small iceberg. 25 images are available for you to vote on. And these got whittled down from 49,000 entries that came from 95 countries. Can you imagine having to pare that 49,000 list down to only 25? So if you want to vote on these or just simply see these stunning images, Google Wildlife Photographer of the Year and you'll be able to look at them. And our last story today is about a sheep. This is a British sheep named Fiona, and she has the moniker Britain's loneliest sheep. She's finally been rescued after being stuck on a beach for two years. First seen by a kayaker in Scotland, Fiona was on a cliff surrounded by water. Several animal rescue organizations attempted to help, but the rescue was complicated. Finally, a group of farmers banded together and used some heavy equipment to bring the sheep up the cliff. The only unforeseen difficulty was that Miss Fiona was very heavy because apparently she spent most of her time eating while stranded on the island. One of the farmers described her as being in incredible condition. Once safely rescued, Fiona was sheared in front of the national media at a farm park. Her fleece, which was so large that it had almost become a danger to Fiona's health, will go to a special wool weaver where it will be made into something special for a charity auction. For photos and more information about Fiona the world's loneliest sheep, just Google Fiona the sheep. And finally today, I'd like to take a moment to talk about a very special dog known as Fred the Afghan. He recently crossed the Rainbow Bridge. Fred was a stray dog living in Afghanistan when he befriended a Marine named Craig Grossi. And during their 4,748 days together, Craig shared stories of their incredible journey and Fred's unwavering and stubborn attitude through his books, Craig and Fred, a Marine and a stray dog and how they rescued each other and second chances, along with hundreds of speaking engagements across the country. Fred's legacy of love and positivity will continue to inspire us all. Craig asks that we hold and keep close those dearest to us and raise a glass for his Freddy. So here's to you, dear Fred, you touched us all. If you want to know more about Fred the Afghan, just Google Fred the Afghan for stories and photos. And now it's time for questions from our listeners. Our first question is from a service dog organization. They ask, we recently lost a smart, athletic, intact male, five-year-old German Shepherd, to a burst perineal hernia. I've searched online, but found very little information on this topic, except for the condition itself and details of the surgical procedures for repair. Can you share any advice as to how to strengthen that area of a dog's body in an effort to prevent this from happening to another dog, especially to an intact dog who has been selected for breeding? So listeners who might not be familiar with a perineal hernia, the perineum is the area below the tail, where the two back legs kind of come together. And the hernia is because the muscles that support the body in that area become weak and the abdominal contents pooch out back uh, towards the tail. And this is a disease of 
intact male dogs. So it's not a surprise that this owner describes this dog as an intact. It's a little bit young. Um, this dog was five. Most dogs are ages seven to nine. And typically, for some strange reason, these hernias tend to occur more on the right, but sometimes they can occur on both sides. And it, this hernia becomes a bona fide emergency if it's so big that the bladder pops up into the hernia and you can actually feel the bladder under the skin on the back end of the dog. And when the bladder flips up into that spot, the dog can't urinate. And that becomes, that's what makes it an emergency is when you can't urinate, it's a big problem. No one really knows what causes this, but we know that being a non-neutered male dog is part of the problem. The CT scans of dogs with um, perineal hernias show that the prostate's not normal either, and that the prostate seems to be in an abnormal position on the CT, suggesting either a cause and effect of the hernia on the location of the prostate, or maybe the prostate's in a weird location, which precipitates the hernia. That's not very clear. Dogs that strain to defecate either because they're constipated or because the prostate is really big and uncomfortable may also predispose them to this condition. And the treatment is reconstruct the muscles on the backside of the dog uh, to fix the hernia and also to neuter the dog. So I'm not sure that there are any exercises to improve the strength of the body wall there, I suspect there is in part a genetic component to this as well. But I would say that a dog who has a perineal hernia may not be a good dog to choose as a dog for breeding uh, because they may have offspring that have the same problem. And when you're looking to have breed therapy dogs or service dogs, you don't want people who depend on those dogs to have any extra medical problems at all. Um, Helen from Detroit is our next question asker. She says it's winter time and very cold here in Michigan. Does my six-year-old golden retriever really need flea and tick medication? Well, if you listen to Dr. Swift talking earlier, um, he spoke a bit about global warming as one of the one health threat that those of us who live on planet Earth are facing. And global warming has increased the length of the year that fleas and ticks are around. And they also have uh, increased the distribution of fleas and ticks in places where they didn't used to be. And I, I would also like to remind our listener only asks about fleas and ticks, but I'm going to expand her question and apply this to heartworm medication as well, because typically they heartworm flea and tick medication kind of all go together. And so global warming is one thing that makes me say, yes, this golden retriever needs year round flea and tick medication. The second thing is the companion animal Parasite Council recommends year-round flea tick and heartworm medications. And I would say that these drugs are so convenient and so safe. Why take a chance that you're going to forget to give it when the weather warms up and then your dog gets sick? It's much easier to prevent the disease than to treat a disease. So I would say keep giving it. The final comment I have is that if I lived in Michigan, I might want to take a break from the snow and cold. And then I would have to remember that I had not given the heartworm flea and tick medication. And so I think that ongoing monthly treatment is just easier to remember every month than to stop and start. So I say better safe than sorry, keep giving the medication. And our last question today comes from Little Rock, Arkansas. Nicholas says, my nine-year-old ragdoll cat loves to eat. I'm worried she might be overweight. How do I know and what do I do? Well, Nick's question is uh, spot on because there's a good chance that he's right. Data in 2022, which is our most recent data, suggests that 61% of American cats are overweight or obese. So just by a coin flip, his ragdoll cat is a good risk of being overweight. So the first thing that he could do is he could see his veterinarian. Um, veterinarians are very good at assessing whether or not your pet needs to lose weight. If you can't get an appointment right away, 
then you might want to go to AMC's website, which is amcny.org. And if you put weight management for cats into the search bar, up will come a little guide that talks about how to know if your cat is overweight. And it gives you some visuals on how to assess your cat's weight, um, even if you're not specially trained. If your cat's overweight, then have your veterinarian help you choose a weight management diet and then stick to that diet and pop into your veterinarian's office every week and weigh your cat. Most veterinarians have a scale right in the lobby and you can just plunk your cat and the carrier on there and then make sure your cat is losing weight every week. And if it's not, then you need to talk to your veterinarian again and revamp the diet project. Nick, I hope that helps you, uh, but I hope even more that your ragdoll isn't overweight, but now you know what to do in case she is. Now we're going to take a short break. And when we come back, we'll have news from the Animal Medical Center and the USDAN Institute. We're back with Dr. Ann Hohenhaus on Ask the Vet. Call now with your pet questions on Sirius XM Stars. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Ask the Vet. We're going to have some news from the Animal Medical Center. So there's been a lot of news about this mystery canine illness. And I say mystery in quotes. Really what's going on is it's some sort of uptick in what's colloquially called kennel cough in dogs. But really the correct name for this disorder is canine infectious respiratory complex. And kennel cough is a highly contagious infectious disease and it has probably around 20 different causes, both bacterial and viral. Some of the causes have big names like Streptococcus equi zoo epidemicus and mycoplasma. And then we have other things that you probably know because as we talked about vaccines earlier today, there are vaccines for Bordetella, parinfluenza, and canine influenza. And those are all also causes of canine infectious respiratory complex. And then there are little known causes, but still important ones like canine respiratory coronavirus, which is completely different than the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID, and canine pneumovirus. Canine distemper virus can also cause a cough as well. So there are a lot of causes of kennel cough. Kennel cough is incredibly common most common in young dogs, and then maybe most severe in older dogs who have other medical conditions. Another group of dogs that are at risk for kennel cough would be the squish face dogs, uh, the brachycephalic dogs, like the ever popular uh, French bulldog or the English bulldog, because those dogs have abnormal respiratory trees and are more prone to severe respiratory infections. Kennel cough is seen by veterinarians every single day of the year. And most dogs cough and don't feel well for a few days and then get better on their own. And so since there seems to be an uptick of canine infectious respiratory disease going around right now, I'm going to share some advice on how to protect your dog. First of all, vaccinate for what you can vaccinate your dog for, and that would be Bordetella, parainfluenza, and canine influenza. We don't think that these organisms are the cause of the current respiratory infection uptick in dogs, but we don't know just yet. And so why have your dog maybe have a twindemic of getting whatever is going around or one of these preventable diseases? Always be skeptical about letting your dog play with dogs you don't know or dogs who appear to be sick because these respiratory infections are spread when one dog coughs or breathes on another dog or when dogs go nose to nose to sniff each other. So uh, right now, since there is this infection that seems to be going around, kind of be wary about mixing up with strange dogs. You might want to stay away from the dog park in your neighborhood, especially if you hear that respiratory illnesses have been diagnosed in your community. Consider alternatives to holiday boarding, 
But that, you know, getting this close to Christmas, you may not have a lot of other alternatives. And that's one of the reasons why you want to always keep your dog's vaccinations up to date is because sometimes you just have to board the dog at the kennel. Another thing that you can do to monitor your pet's health is learn to count your dog's respiratory rate. A rate greater than 40 breaths per minute indicates the need to take your dog to the emergency room. And you can learn how to properly count your dog's respiratory rate by watching a short video on AMC's website. Just go to amcny.org and put in the search bar counting dog's respiratory rate. And up will come a very cute video of a very cute dog who's breathing quietly, and there'll be a countdown clock to help you practice counting how many times a minute Arlie is breathing. And then, of course, if your dog is showing signs of a respiratory illness, runny eyes, runny nose, coughing, or fever, please go to your veterinarian. But before you go, call and tell them that you have a dog that has coughing and other respiratory signs so they can track you through the clinic to keep everyone else's dog safe. In addition to common respiratory diseases like kennel cough, there is a thought to be this unidentified but apparently contagious respiratory illness spreading across the country. And the Ustan Institute recently hosted a pet health event on the canine illness, and you can get more information by logging into AMC's website to watch the video at amcny.org backslash USDAN, U-S-D-A-N events. Now, USDAN Institute for Animal Health Education has all kinds of great information, all free, to help you take care of your pet. We've got pet health articles, upcoming pet health events, video tutorials like the respiratory rate counter, and other pet parent educational resources. Just go to our homepage, amcny.org, and click on pet health information. I want to take a minute to thank my special guest, Dr. Nigel Swift, for the fascinating conversation about bees and the honeybee vaccine. I now know 100% more about bees than I did at the beginning of this show. I'd like to give a big thank you to everyone who's downloaded the Asavet podcast, which you can do on any of the podcast platforms that are your favorites. Because of your ongoing support, the Asavet podcast is ranked fourth on Feedspot's 2023 Top 45 Health Podcast. Don't forget, contact me if you have a question about your pet's health. Just email me at askthevet at amcny.org, and I'll answer your questions on next month's Ask the Vet program. The Ask the Vet podcast is available on the Sirius app across major platforms and also on AMC's website. This is all thanks to AMC's longstanding partnership with Sirius XM. Now, don't forget to check us out on social media. On Facebook, it's The Animal Medical Center. And on Twitter and Instagram, it's AMCNY. I hope that you'll like and subscribe to make sure you receive all the new episodes of Ask the Vet. And if you wouldn't mind, it'd be so great if you would take a moment to give us a review. I hope you'll join me again next month, and that will be in 2024. Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, and Happy New Year to everyone. Thanks for listening and making this another fun Ask the Vet podcast.